let's begin. And let me first welcome and uh, Dave Farley. And uh, everybody knows Dave. Uh, Dave, what year did you start shooting? What year did you first charge? 1967, I charged my first money for horseshoeing. You know, I, I, I saw that on the IAPF site and I kept doing the math. I couldn't figure it out how you're still in your 50s. I love that. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, so we're going to have Dave talk a little bit about the business side of things. You know, again, if you're just logging on, type those questions in. We'll go through Dave, uh, Dave's brain as much as possible. So let, let's start. Dave, uh, I think one of the things a lot of farriers are experiencing, uh, of course, are the increased cost. And uh, remarkably, a nice thing to see in our, our most recent survey of farriers, uh, everybody's raising their prices at this time. It's out of necessity. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a thing that maybe some have done just for the beginning of the year, whenever they're comfortable about raising their prices. But a curious thing I, I've seen in this is 63% have raised their prices more than once. Um, in your experience, how, what was the most effective way to communicate price increases with your clients? Well, years ago, I was lucky to have a mentor that, that taught me that the cost of living went up every year and that that should be factored in. Uh, we shouldn't have to absorb that. And he used the example of a good friend of his, a very good farrier, hadn't went up on his prices for 10 years. And uh, he was basically just barely getting along. So he encouraged me to think about that as well as the prices of our products. So we made it a practice in the early 80s to start sending out a newsletter to our clients expressing the concern we had with that. And uh, we worded it in such a way that, th that they really accepted it. We let them know that our profit margin was already set and that we felt that the way we budgeted our shoeing price, everything had to stay that same uh, level for us to make our profit margin. And that we were out, out of goodwill and appreciation of them, we were only going to go up the cost of the cost of living and our, our materials that we bought. I was, I was never uh, challenged on that. They thought that was very nice. I even had clients ask me, is that all you have to go up? Wouldn't it be better if you go up a little bit more? And I said, no, I have my profit margin figured in. I figured years ago, back in the 30s, my grandpa told me that they were lucky to save 7%. And I think every person should try to put a minimum of 10% personally uh, in the savings account, minimum. So I think education of the client, Jeremy, is what's, what's helped me with newsletters. Yeah, well, let, since you brought that up, let's go there. And you know, we've talked about this, we've written about it. I think it's certainly one of the easiest ways to, to communicate with your clients and also deliver them something of value. Can you talk about your newsletter process? Well, years ago, I don't know what year it was actually, but uh, I, I used to send out a newsletter every year. It would usually be the end of the, the holiday season, thanking them for their business and, and show appreciation. Also, let them be aware that effective January 1st, we would have a price increase explaining that. Once I got hooked up with the FPD and they started the natural angle, uh, there's a, a, quite a bit of information in there that owners, I felt, would appreciate. So I started inserting my little one page or two page newsletter in that and sending that out. And that that's, was well received. Um, I've, I've never, I've always had positive comments from the owners or the trainers about that. So we've been doing it for a long time. And, and I think that the best way to do is to not only share the bad news of a cost or a price increase, but to share some education with them at the same time. Yeah, and by education, what are some of the things you might choose to share? Well, in the in the early years, it was basic. You know, you had the the clients that were, uh, you know, Western type horses or standard bred type horses. So it was basic information on how to properly clean a foot. Uh, I had pictures I showed of really sharp screwdrivers that shouldn't be used. Uh, I also let them know they shouldn't wire brush the top of the cornet fan. I I went in and grabbed horses' feet that were bloody. Uh, common sense uh, thrush, uh, I think, is very important for 
the average owner or caretaker of a horse to know that thrush medicine on a wet foot does nothing. The foot has to be dried out before you apply any type medicine or you're just wasting your time. Uh, I, and I continue to use that if I get new clients. My old clients are very educated to the, to the problem of fungus and bacteria in the foot. So I usually only send that to new ones. So we started off very, very basic. And then later I, I really targeted my, my clients. You know, we have, we have three major clients and that's dressage, jumpers and hunters, mostly all jumpers now. But at the time I, I would send information on, on the horse's limbs and things to look for, your, your valgus and varus horses. It, it was basic stuff to a farrier, but it was rocket science to the owners and they really appreciated any information I gave them. Do you find it, it's a good tactic to use those newsletters to sort of maintain yourself as their expert and, and keep them from wandering away onto Dr. Google to find answers? <laughs> well, occasionally they're always going to have something sent to them and they're going to question about it. However, I find it very enlightening that they call me to ask me if there's any value to that. It gets tough for me because there's so much information out there. Some of it's okay, but there's a lot of it that is merely selling a product uh, and it, it doesn't even explain how to apply that product. So yeah, I, I still get that occasionally, but very, very rarely. Um, I started educating my clients very early and, and maybe that's why I'm still fortunate enough to have some for almost 30 years now. Um, I, I told all of them when they were kids, someday we'll go to the Olympics together. And uh, boy, I was lucky. I hit a home run on a couple of those. Excellent. Um, we've had a couple more people log on just uh, for you folks. If you have any questions for Dave or Mike and McGuire later when we talk about planning, uh, feel free to type those in and we'll go through your questions. And, uh, you know, Dave, you, you've talked about your experience. And of course, you were at Ohio State. You, you started maybe at the lower end before that. You've also worked on the, the, the Western side. And, you know, now you're, you're at the highest level of sport horses. What are the commonalities that you see across the board? Because I, I see some names here, different regions, different levels of experience of your experience going back to 1972 of running an effective business. What, what are those common themes that everybody should consider adapting? Well, whether it's business or, or your personal life, I think, I think we can group though. There's three things that I really believe that all farriers should consider. So to be successful, you need integrity, intelligence, and energy. The most important thing for you to have is integrity as a farrier, as well as a, you know, a good person, a productive life. Remember, people that have integrity usually make the best choices and they have the best results in business and life. They also have the best habits. Habits every one of us have, whether we have a good habit or a lazy or a problem of being prompt, you can drink or you can smoke. Everybody has the choices on those habits. The most important thing that everybody needs to realize in the farrier industry is that you have a choice of your habit. We all have the choice of what our habits are. So choose your habit. Choose your habit wisely and try to make your habits positive, not negative. That's showing up on time. That's cleaning up after yourself, um, texting ahead of time, so on and so forth. Because positive habits affect everybody around you, as well as negative habits affect everybody around you, think about the difference between those two. Each, each one of you listening to this tonight have a certain amount of potential. Everybody here has potential. And your potential is based on several things, but what you do with that potential is based on a lot of the habits that you have or the habits that you will form as you develop your business. And try to make those habits, habits that you can build on. So maybe some of you already are aware of your habits, whether they're negative or positive, Maybe somebody listening 
is going to start a, a habit today, but it's all about our habits that makes our potential either positive or negative being a failure. It really does. So here's, here's a little um, challenge I give everybody tonight, and then I'll get off my high horse. Everyone should take a piece of paper and on the left side of that paper, think about a person that you would most likely want to be like. Everyone everywhere wants to move ahead in their business and get ahead in life. So think about who you would like to be like, who would you like to emulate, in your business? Who would you like to trade places with? Who would you like to learn from as much as possible? And who has already achieved what you would like to achieve in your business? So then on the right side of that paper, make another list and come down from the top. Think about who you would least likely like to be like. Who that when you hear their voice or you hear their vehicle coming down the road, it turns you off, it makes you feel repulsive. Who is made obvious negative and bad choices, as well as bad habits. And then everybody needs to look at that list. Just look at the left side of that list. Everything on that left side that is positive could be you. Every one of you could be that person. So choose your habits and make the right choices, uh, both in business and in life. And I personally believe that it's really that simple. There's, there's obvious, obviously a lot more detail into the business part of it, but if you truly have a positive uh, outlook and you have integrity, intelligence, and energy, you, you'll take your business wherever you want. Um, you know, something along those sides, the, that right side of the page, sometimes you may feel that way about clients. Uh, did you find, is that usually a case of burnout or... Maybe it's just an indication it's time to graduate to a better list of clients. How do you feel about that? We, we've, always, we've always attempted in the younger days to, uh, to really feel out our clients. But you know, when you're first starting off, everybody that's young, you have to take anything that you can get. But usually your gut feeling on that client is, is re reality. <laughs> the bottom line is that is reality. It's probably never going to get better or rarely does it ever get any better. So I suggest as you, as you reach your income potential with that client or that discipline, think about if the opportunity comes up for you to replace that client, to do that, but do that in a way that you don't burn a bridge. Try to turn that client over to somebody that may be in the position you were when you took it on but try not to burn that bridge. I've left many clients over the years for different reasons. And uh, I'm, I'm tickled to death every time I get a call from one later. How you been? I, I know things didn't work out. I know you couldn't travel here or there, but any chance I can get you back. Always remember, no matter how bad that client was, you may end up with them. And at some point, if you educate them right, they will become a good client. Yeah. And, um, you know, Dave, we've talked about this before. Could you explain your interview process for a, a potential client? I just did that this week. I've, I've told everybody I'm on the downside, and I think most people know that. I still have a, a, quite a few farriers that are trying to meet me different places to do ride-alongs, but I did have somebody that just came into the country and had gotten my name from a very well-known farrier that everybody knows in Europe, and uh, they asked if I would do their horses, and I said, you know, I'm coming up there. Um, it's going to be too early to do your horses, but I'd really like to talk to you about that. Here's where I'm staying. Where are you staying? We both agreed on a place to, to meet. It's usually a Starbucks and it's usually early in the morning. So we met with them. I asked them to bring a list of things that they expect from a farrier or would like to have from a farrier. And this client, no different than any other client, they want somebody that will show up on time that will clean up after themselves, will keep their horses sound and healthy and winning. That's their main concerns. I give them my piece of paper, which explains everything that I expect from a client. The five things it takes to do a perfect shoeing job, a clean, flat, dry, well-lit area, and a perfect standing horse. And uh, they just kind of stare at it for a little bit. 
So we, we get ready to leave and they say, well, you're gonna do the horses? And I'll say, no, I want you to think about that a little bit. And I slide it over to them and I set up a, a, another meeting. This particular meeting was not for me. It was for me to set up another farrier with. So we met with them last night and uh, I had the other farrier there. I introduced them and it was a, it was a home run. So the, the interview thing for me has worked very well for over 20 years. I'm very honest with them. I, I, I have interviewed some people that it didn't work out. And then I end up catching them on the road, you know, New York or California or Texas, wherever, and helping them out. So don't ever burn those bridges. Yeah. Uh, what are your warning signs during an interview of saying, this is not a client I want to take on? Oh, a lot of warning signs. Mo most often, it's, uh, there's no attention to, uh, to our meeting itself. They're on the cell phone constantly. Uh, they don't they don't look at the piece of paper that you give them with things that we need. Uh, they don't show up on time, J just like a horseshoe. <laughs> the same negative qualities that that owners and trainers complain about farriers. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, our, our surveys and, you know, going back years, uh, not showing up on time or at all <clears throat> remains the number one reason to to be fired and Certainly, that might be a case where a farrier just doesn't want to return to the client. Uh, but do you feel in the sense that, I know you said keeping a horse sound, keeping in the show ring, keeping it winning is a big concern, but it sounds like just those basics of showing up when you say you will and, and cleaning up after yourself will get you a long way with a lot of clients. No matter what discipline, no matter what country you're in, uh, it's the same all over the world. Those basic things that... Uh, that aren't focused on enough, I don't think, and, and possibly maybe either in the schools or maybe we're not uh, not beating that bush enough, but the very basics, you're 100% correct. That is the biggest thing. It really is. And I think farriers have a, a problem with that. When we start off, we're very hungry. We're, we're taking on all the clients that we can get. And, uh, and when we're starting off, we have a lot of debt. We pay that debt off. And sadly, we don't think about the investment in ourself down the road. We want the new toys, we want a new fishing rod. Uh, we don't think about that 10%, basic 10% that should be going back. And uh, so we spend all the money that we have and we wait so long that we get farther and farther behind. So we have to continue to build up more and more numbers and horses to make that profit margin that we want to keep us happy every day. I think there needs to be a, a really big focus on the schools. And uh, at some point, I, I know they do the best they can in the short, uh, the short amount of time that students are in school, but it's a really a sad thing. I know so many good farriers that did not plan well. And uh, I myself was one in the first, you know, 15, 17 years, I didn't plan as well. And uh, I had to make up for that. Thank goodness I, I did. But uh, yeah, to be able to, to plan better, and uh, make sure that you're, you're communicating with everybody, no matter what we're talking about tonight, communication with farriers to owners and keep your numbers to where you can manage that. Uh, it's all about the horse, you know. And we, we can like or dislike our clients, but we really have to try to, to keep that horse sound. If we don't keep that horse sound, it's gonna catch us. And uh, when you know there's an issue coming up, you need to communicate with those owners and, and speak about it ahead of time, just like you should think about your whole career ahead of time. Yeah, so you're, you're advocating being proactive. If you see something coming, you don't wanna, is the thinking you don't wanna catch the blame down the road? I'm pretty, I'm pretty good about that. You know, in the, in the performance world and, and all guys that shoot performance horses know that, we all get under that horse that uh, maybe that one front leg can't extend forward to get on the foot stand or that hind leg when you're, when you're clinch blocking the nail, he has a spasm. Uh, I'm very good about mentioning that to owners. And I make a note of that on their, on their bills. Uh, even though I mention it to the groom, I want, I want the person that's in charge of that horse to know. And you would be surprised at how many thanks I've gotten from them because they'll, they'll call a vet in or that maybe the horse slightly didn't pass the jog and they'll say, you had that, you noticed that before anyone else. And I think all farriers, we do all notice that. I think it would be a good habit for everyone to start putting that in their, in their uh, 
brain to put that on the bill, to pass that on to owners. Any little thing you know, including a cut on a coronary band. I, I had a lady bring a horse to me in Michigan two days ago, and, and she asked me to check the shoe. The shoes were fine. And I said, what's the problem? She said, that cut over there, I felt that the shoe was was uh, maybe the problem. We just had the horse shod. And I said, that cut looks like it's been there for a week. <laughs> And, and it hasn't had any medication, you know, your groom should have pointed that out. I kind of, I kind of steered them away from the, you know, them being upset with the farrier because the farrier just shot the horse and he didn't mention it. So that's one thing we've always done. We mentioned that. Any yeah. issue? We yeah. A quick note I'll make, and if, if some of you watching are, are young, uh, maybe just out of school yourself and feel you're a little deficient in the business side of things, for years at American Farriers Journal, we've published a free resource of a magazine and annual that we give away to the shoeing schools and really anybody who wants it. So you can contact us at American Farriers Journal, give us a call, it's in the magazine or come to our site at AmericanFarriers.com, reach out to me and we'll get you a copy of it. But uh, it really focuses on a lot of what Dave's talking about, those good business practices to get you started off the right foot. Um, Dave, you, you talked about putting a note on the invoice, and so that's going to lead me to my next question, and that's avoiding those late payers, improving the cash flow of your business. What tactics have worked for you over the years? Well, they've all worked. Some just work better than others. Uh, we, we, you know, we did the paper deal and got the promises the the check will be on the door and you know, the wind blew it off and I'll send you another one. We've, we've, we've heard it all. Uh, my practice right now is we don't, we don't accept cash. We don't accept checks. It's credit card only or Venmo. Uh, right now, about 20% of our people are, are really liking the Venmo or any, any electronic payment is, is simple. For some reason in the jumper industry right now, the Venmo is, is working. But we, we had our own book. It, it, it's a tireless job if you don't educate your clients. Uh, my policy is, is very strict. I think every farrier needs a policy, a payment policy. And that's something that's on my little note when I give, when I interview a client, um, it's on that. Payment is expected when services are rendered. Um, you can see that in a doctor's office, a lawyer's office. I mean, that, that's just a, being professional. And if you start off that way, you rarely have any issues, but chasing money has been very, very difficult for all farriers through the years. It's, it's, a, it's tireless. It, it will wear you out. It's exhausting. And there's nothing worse than have a big client that you've, you've really worked hard to get and the bills get away from you. That's your biggest number one um, income and maybe 20, 30% of your income and you can't get the money for it. That, that really hurts. Know the signs. It, it, really set um, set and the communication if you don't set a policy you're you're going to have struggles no matter how you accept payments uh, what type of payment you want to accept is up to you but all farriers need a policy of what's expected just don't say yes i'll be there in a week and show up and don't have a policy it's it will catch you and and you'll be left short you know, um, we just read this report, the AAP had compiled talking about late payments and one veterinarian took the time, went through their, their open accounts and they found out they were carrying $65,000. Uh -huh. uh, switching to credit card took that down to zero. Uh -huh. So there, there's a lot of truth in what you're saying. I know it's apples to oranges, but I think there's a lesson to be learned there. And even better, they said maybe they lost five clients over it but it was the clients they don't want to work with. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And that's, that's a good way. When you set a policy, sometimes you're going to lose a client when you set a policy. And that's usually the client that's, that's had difficulty with payments. Uh, we were the same way. In, in the late 80s and early 90s, we were carrying 40 grand on the books. And I had people working for me and doing a lot of traveling. And you, you just can't eat that. I mean, you, you end up paying more office time and and uh, and in mailing time, then th this should be done. It, it should be a, a policy that set, uh, get your money ASAP, credit cards, you, you can 
add that fee into that so that you're not losing anything. It's the, most of your good companies are 3% or less right now. So just add that into your, into your bill so you don't lose on that. Yeah. A, a follow-up question on what you mentioned about Venmo. Uh, what, what sort of fees are you experiencing with that? I'm the wrong one to ask on that. I, I really, <laughs> I, as far as I know, it's very minimal. It's less than the credit card from what I understand. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts on now we're, we're experiencing, you know, ups, I haven't seen many downs, but a lot of ups with fuel prices, adding a fuel surcharge or a barn fee to your, to your bill. We just ran into three farriers at Michigan when we got there, and that, that's the number one topic right now with farriers. Um, one guy drove a long way. His, his fuel bill was, was almost 500 bucks, uh, pulling a trailer and, and taking some things. Uh, all three of these gentlemen never thought about this until they were on the road, and, and all three of them told me that the first time they filled up, <laughs> it hit them, so they notified their clients ahead of time. Listen you either are going to have us turn around right now or you're going to have to realize there's going to be a, a, a high extra cost on each horse for us coming up there and then having to go back so i think everybody that's that's listening to this and everybody that's a practicing farrier right now you really need to consider this there's rumors going around that it's only going to go up to six dollars a gallon um i have a friend that owns a, a horse transportation company he's he is expecting ten dollars a gallon diesel by September. Um, if you don't make your clients aware that it's going to cost more, but I do think you, you hurt yourself by setting uh, a dollar price. If you say, oh, I'm going to, you already went up once, let's say for instance, you went up the beginning of the year. Now you're going to go up an extra $10 a horse and a, a month and a half, two months from now, it goes up another dollar a gallon. I think you're in trouble. I think it, you'd be better off to explain to your clients and educate them that there, there's going to be an extra cost due or that's going to reflect the cost of your travel expenses, including fuel. Okay. Then, uh, getting back to your invoices, uh, what are you putting on your invoice? Uh, like how detailed of the service? You had mentioned a note you might include, but are you putting on like everything you applied to the horse? No, we, we don't get into the detail of the horses. Now, we keep track of that ourselves, but that doesn't go on the invoice. Um, I, I'm a little bit different than most farriers. Our clients travel a lot. So almost all of our clients travel with extra shoes for their horses in case they lose a shoe or change something. Um, so we don't include those numbers on the billing. Uh, we, we do include anything that we see with the horse or, or that's an added cost. Uh, we include everything on that. There's a note area, of course, on the bottom of the bill where we, we have things already typed out, you know, for, you know, we notice your horse is a bit uh, heel sore. Uh, possible uh, things could be navicular or a bruise or a corn. Uh, that's all pre-done by me ahead of time. And I advise my wife to include that on that horse's bill. So those are typed out and explained to the client any irregularities we see at that, that point. Okay. And, uh, you know, maybe some people are wa watching who are thinking about expanding beyond their local service, thinking about serving clients who travel to shows and following them. Uh, what advice, what, what worries do you want to present them with? What are some things maybe they, they may not consider that surprised you when you, you changed your practice? That's probably the best question that's been asked so far because you, you can really go in the hole when you're traveling and it's grossly overlooked. And uh, this is the ferry that I see that travels and uh, he, didn't, he didn't consider the cost and expenses that were included in that, not just the rising cost of fuel, but like I was in Michigan this weekend, our motel was 397 a night. I had two rooms, two nights. Uh, the clients have to be aware of that. And I, I'm not a, afraid of an extra cost like that to, to take a photocopy of that and include that in their, in their statement. But I think farriers that, that want to start traveling really need to communicate, have a sit down coffee with that client and say, here are my costs. Uh, you don't have to go in exact detail, but we have a four shoe cost and, and our costs are aluminum or steel. We have a cost for pads and pours and so on and so forth. But 
I'm a little different. I charge for my travel time. And uh, I let them know that my time starts when I close my door at my house and it ends when I close it when I get back home. So I, I get travel time and I get all the expenses that, that are included on that. And I, I really never had an issue with that as long as that's discussed ahead of time. It's the ones that maybe, there may be a horse with that trainer that isn't there all the time, but I, I caught them at one show and try on and they say, oh my goodness, there was an extra $80 on that horse's bill. And I said, well, yes, that, that's all my travel tip. Once you explain it to them, they're okay. But it, it's, it really is something that all farriers that are considering traveling, they need to, they need to discuss that. Uh, it's, it's something that there's details in there that you just don't consider. You really don't. My son traveling up there this weekend, we charge a, we charge a, a rate for him to drive up. And uh, he had a flat tire on the way, he ended up not making it that night. Uh, he, did, he did arrive on time the next morning. But uh, that's an extra cost, an extra motel, so on and so forth. It was included that my, my clients are, I, I usually have my money by midnight or by noon the next day when you're taking credit card. And I rarely ever have. I expressed it to them. But when we got there, we had an issue, took a little bit longer, a little bit extra charge is going to be on your travel. I'm just glad you're here, Dave. Thank you very much. Sweep up when you leave. <laughs>